Well, we're going to have our Bible reading now, and the passage is Luke chapter 18, uh, verses uh, 1 to 8. So grab your Bibles, and, uh, and I'll be reading that passage for us now. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? on earth. Over to Pete. Afternoon everyone, thanks so much for joining us uh, as we continue through Jesus' school of prayer in the Gospel of Luke. We're thinking today about praying without giving up and uh, given that we're going to be talking together about prayer this afternoon, why don't I pray for us now as we come to the Bible. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that through it you speak to us. I pray now, Lord, that you would help us in this time, that we would uh, see Jesus more clearly, see ourselves more clearly, and the Spirit of God, you will be at work changing us. We ask these things for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me begin by uh, sharing this with you. I struggle to pray without giving up. I've been through seasons in my life when talking to God has come easier to me and I've been more disciplined and more steady, but more often than not, I find prayer hard. It's a fight, it's a challenge. Perhaps you can relate to that. If you're a Christian with us today, you'll probably know that sometimes you pray and you're flying. You can really sense that you are communicating with God. You feel the leading of the Holy Spirit as you speak to him and you see answers to your prayers in powerful and tangible ways. And you think, I love prayer. I love talking to God. It's amazing. I don't ever want to stop. But I think for most of us, more often than not, prayer is hard. It takes discipline. You wonder if anyone really hears you. You don't see the answers that you are looking for, hoping for. And you think, what's the point? And your mind starts to wonder, You check your emails on your phone and you ask yourself, is prayer supposed to be this hard? Am I doing it wrong? I want to give up. Well, here's the good news for us today. Jesus knows us better than we think. He knows that we struggle to pray, that often we find it hard and we want to give up, which is why in his school of prayer, his next lesson here in Luke 18 is a parable teaching us, verse 1, that we should always pray and not give up. If prayer was easy, and normal Christians never wanted to give up, then Jesus wouldn't have bothered teaching this lesson. So if, like me, you often find prayer hard, I hope that you're already encouraged this afternoon, and you're leaning in to find out how to make your prayers persistent. How to pray without giving up. Now here's the question I want to begin with this afternoon. What fuels persistent prayer? What drives it? What helps us to keep going when it's hard and when we feel like giving up? The answer, Jesus tells us, is faith. Faith fuels persistent prayer. That's our big idea this afternoon. Faith fuels persistent prayer. We see it in Luke 18, but we're going to do something that we're not supposed to do uh, when you're reading a story. We're going to start by reading the last line first. If you do that when you read stories, there is something wrong with you. I know some of you do do that. But you're not supposed to do that. But here, 
Jesus, having taught his disciples about praying and not giving up, says there in verse 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now that's weird, because you would expect him to say, when the Son of Man comes, will he find prayer on the earth? Prayer is, after all, what he's been talking about. But he mentions faith instead, which initially may seem to come out of nowhere. But here's the thing that we need to realise today. Prayer is the quintessential expression of faith. Faith is trusting in God to help us. Being confident that he is all that he promises to be for us in the gospel. Faith says, I can't do it, but you can. And in that sense, prayer is faith in action. If you truly believe that only God can help, that that God stands ready to help and he wants to help, then you pray for as long as it takes without giving up. We say with the disciple Peter to the Lord Jesus, Lord, where else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Our faith rests in you alone, Jesus. So we're here again, asking, pleading, not giving up. Faith fuels persistent prayer. And what we find in this short parable and Jesus' explanation following it are three reasons for faith. Three reasons to fuel our prayers. Three reasons why we should pray and not give up. But we'll get there in a moment. To understand where Jesus is coming from, let's first examine the parable together. And we find two characters, a widow and an unjust judge. And the widow is in trouble. In the first century, she would have been very vulnerable. Her husband would have been her provider, her protector, her voice in the public square. But now that she's dead, now that he's dead, sorry, she is easy pickings for someone who wanted to take advantage of her. And that is exactly what has happened. And so she comes to the judge in her town in verse 4, and she says, grant me justice against my adversary. She wants the judge to restore to her what has been lost. Perhaps it's money, or land, or her reputation, who knows what it is. Whatever the case, Jesus just wants us to know that what she's asking for is fair, is right, is just. But the bad news is that the judge in her town is corrupt, unjust. Twice in verses 2 and 4 we're told he didn't fear God nor care about what people thought of him. In other words, he didn't worry whether God would hold him accountable for how fair his rulings were and neither did he care what people thought about him. He couldn't let care less if people thought that he was corrupt. So what? It didn't matter to him. As long as he was comfortable, as long as he lived in peace, he was happy. And so when the widow comes and pleads, grant me justice, he refuses. Maybe it would have cost him something. Maybe her adversary was a powerful ally of his or would be useful if he owed the judge a favour. What will the judge gain from uh, ruling for the widow? Nothing. And therefore, justice was not forthcoming. But instead of going away disappointed, verse 3 says the widow keeps coming. Grant me justice. Grant me justice. Day after day, morning and night, she shouts in his courtroom. She stands at the end of his driveway. Grant me justice. Grant me justice. I'm not going away until you grant me justice. And eventually the judge says, this girl is crazy. I don't fear God. I don't care about what people think but I'll give her justice just so that she doesn't attack me. So that's the parable. And some people read this and they say, okay, so what was Jesus telling us here that God is like the unjust judge? Basically, in order to get justice, I have to bug him until he's so fed up with me that he gives me what I want? That doesn't seem very faith-building. And it isn't, because, of course, That isn't what Jesus is saying here. He is simply arguing from the lesser to the greater. Verse 6, he says, listen to what the unjust judge says. And the implication is, 
If the unjust judge grants a widow justice, how much more will God give justice to us, to his children, when we pr pray persistently? And so what Jesus does here is he contrasts the character of the unjust judge with the character of God. And he reminds us of three things about God that should cause us to put our faith in him and fuel our prayers. And here's the first. God loves justice. Jesus asks the rhetorical question there in verse 7. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will not God bring about justice? Answer, yes, he will. God loves justice. In fact, we've already seen that had the judge in the parable feared God, he would have been motivated to judge justly because he would have known that God, that God loves what is just. We live, don't we, at a time when so many people are crying out for justice, whether it's Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, even Brexit can be seen as a cry for justice, whichever side of the argument you came down on. We long to live in a society, in a world, where justice is done. But we have to recognise that that longing is derivative. It's, it's in us because we're made in the image of God. Our desire for justice comes from him. And because our desire for justice comes from him, we need to recognise, firstly, that God gets to decide what justice is. In the Bible, God talks about justice a lot. It's a multifaceted, rich idea. Uh, justice refers both to retribution, to the punishment of uh, those who have done wrong, and to the idea of restoring right relationship between human be beings, between us and God. Justice is the way things were always meant to be. Unity, peace, harmony. And God expects his people to be characterised by justice. That means that when we pray, we need to ask ourselves, is what we're praying for in line with the justice of God? Or is it our own conception of what justice should be? God decides what justice is. He reveals it to us in his word. And second, we need to know that God cares about justice more than we do. We often get outraged at injustice. And that's good. It's right. We should be upset and work for change when we see these things. But the fact is that for every act of injustice that comes to our attention, we ignore the thousands of others that occur every day, even in our own lives. But God sees them. And unlike the unjust judge, God cares deeply about justice. Now all of this should fuel us to pray for justice without giving up. Listen, often in response to injustice, we'll campaign We'll post on social media, we'll speak to our friends. Those are good things. We raise awareness. But if we don't talk to God about it, that says something about how effective we believe prayer to be. That says something about how little we value or we feel that God values justice. That says something about where we believe the power for true and lasting change really lies. And in response, Jesus encourages us today to believe, to have faith that God loves justice far more than we do. He hates what is evil. He loves what is good. And he invites us to pray from that faith and not give up. So that's our first point. God loves justice. Secondly, God chose you. The widow was nobody to the unjust judge. She only becomes someone of interest when she threatens his comfort and security. But if you are a Christian here today, hear how Jesus describes you in verse 7. His chosen ones. You know, one very real reason for giving up when we cry out for, for justice 
is that we feel that no one takes any notice of us. We're not significant. We're easily ignored. And people all around the world today live in a state of defeat. The victims of injustice, but with no hope that anyone will take any notice and help them. But that is not the case with God and his people. Imagine for me, for a moment, the heavenly courtroom. And God, the judge of the universe, is seated and his courtroom is filled with a cacophony of noise. Millions upon millions of people raising their voices to him all at the same time, asking, pleading, praising, worshipping. But when you arrive, God says, hold on, it's Johnny Clayton. I chose him. I want to hear what he has to say. Wait, wait a second. It's Mercy and Googie. I love her. She is precious to me. I want to hear her voice. Isn't it remarkable that the judge of the universe inclines his ear to his chosen ones? He bends down like a father with a child so that he can hear us better when we pray. Each of us who belong to Jesus, who trust in him for forgiveness of our sins, we are valuable to him. Our voice matters. We are his chosen ones. Now, if you don't know Jesus today, it is great to have you join us. Um, let me just say this to you. The invitation is there. God wants you to trust in him, to put your faith in him. He wants you to experience that closeness of relationship. He wants there to be justice, restoration of relational harmony between yourself and him. And that is why you need Jesus to forgive your sins. Your sins stand in the way of your relationship with God. They cut you off from him, from his blessing. So if you don't know God today, let me invite you. Trust in Jesus. Connect with City Church. Someone would love to talk to you about how to do that. But even right now, wherever you are, just pray and ask God to forgive you and make you his. You see, for all of us who know Jesus, our voice matters to God, which should again give us faith to pray. Often we might feel like God doesn't hear us, but Jesus says to us when we think that way, you're wrong. If you've been chosen by God, you belong to his family. He listens to every word that you say. Even the ones you mutter under your breath, the stuff that is so raw and painful that you struggle to articulate it, God hears you. So don't stop praying. Don't lose heart when you think that you have been ignored. You haven't been. You are one of his chosen ones. And he is attentive to your every word. That's the second thing. And thirdly, Jesus reminds us today that God acts quickly. God acts quickly. If we do not expect a response from God, we stop asking the question. But in verse 8 we read that when we cry out to God for justice, day and night, repeatedly, without giving up, Jesus says, I tell you, God will see that they get justice, and quickly. That's a promise right there. God will give us justice quickly. But what does that mean? What about the Christians in various parts of the world who are in prison right now for following Jesus? They've been praying, where is their quick justice? Well, we have to come to realize that God's timing is not the same as ours. What God means by quickly is actually quicker, slower, and exactly the same as what we mean by quickly. Did I say that in a way that was confusing enough? Good, well, let me explain what I mean. God grants us justice more quickly than we expect when we pray because he has already done it 2,000 years ago at the cross. Because at that moment, God passed judgment on his son. He placed all of the injustices of his chosen ones that you and I had committed on Jesus and punished 
him in our place. And Jesus willingly bore the justice of God for us because as his chosen ones, he loves us. Here's the thing. We can pray, grant us justice today without fear. Perhaps you had not even crossed your mind that you should be afraid when you pray such a prayer, but you have to remember, each of us are perpetrators of injustice. For example, I was reflecting on it this week. All of us are, to some degree or another, racist. We all have cultural preferences that place those who are like us ahead of those who are not. Justice, absolute justice for George Floyd and for Black Lives Matters and for the racial reconciliation movement, that justice results in every one of us, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, whatever, being found guilty before God. And yet God does not punish us for our sins if we belong to Jesus. He calls us to repent and turn from them, but he places our punishment on Christ at the cross, which means that when we pray, give us justice, we can do so with confidence if we are Christians, because it would be unjust for God to punish us for our sins because they have already been paid for. We do not simply appeal to the mercy of God when we pray. We appeal to his justice because as a just judge, he cannot punish the same sin twice. Justice demands that we are accepted. God's justice comes to us quicker than we expect when we pray, but it also comes slower than we sometimes expect. This parable comes at the end of a section in Luke's Gospel where Jesus is talking about the end of the world and how he will return at the end of time to judge the world in justice. He describes himself in chapter 17 as the Son of Man. And so when he says in verse 8, God will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He clearly has the end of the world in mind. Now, that may be sounds quite disappointing to you as you consider that today, but let's think for a moment about what that means. When Jesus comes, perfect justice will finally be established on the earth. Harmony, peace, unity, justice. That is what the world will be like. I remember vividly, um, 2008, uh, Barack Obama was elected as the new president of the United States, and In his victory speech that took place in Chicago, thousands upon thousands of people thronged around the stage, uh, cheering and celebrating, and, and the chant rang out, yes, we can, yes, we can. It was felt with the election of Obama that finally, finally, justice would come to the United States. Real change would happen. Now, hear me. This isn't a knock on President Obama. Uh, For what it's worth, my personal opinion of him, He did some great things, he did some terrible things, exactly like every other politician that has ever been or will ever be. Because that's my point, actually. Nobody, prime ministers, presidents, grassroots campaigners, nobody will deliver justice like Jesus. He is the one we look to, to bring us the justice that our hearts crave. And the great news is that he will deliver it quickly. Yes, we are still waiting 2,000 years after he said these words. But with God, a day is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is like a day. And so we should pray with faith as we look to that day. That day is where our ultimate hope lies. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. So we're saying quickly is faster than we expect, slower than we expect. But finally, quickly can mean exactly what we understand by quickly. Amazon Prime, McDonald's, Usain Bolt, quickly. God acts for us today. He loves to answer our prayers and see that justice is done. He doesn't always respond as we expect, but often he works justice in response to our prayers. One of the things I love about City Church and one of the things that I pray for Trinity Church now that we have planted is that is the racial unity that that exists in our church. There is, of course, so much more that needs to be done. 
But it always strikes me as a work of God's grace that people from 40 different countries, from a wide variety of heritage, skin colour, ethnicity, nationality, language, can belong to one church and enjoy such unity and community together. That didn't just happen. We didn't do that. That is what God is doing in us in response to our prayers. Grant us justice, O Lord. Make us a people who reflect the justice that took place at the cross when Christ died for us and brought us together as one new humanity, one family. Give us justice. Make us a people who reflect the justice that is to come, giving us a glimpse of the unity and diversity that will characterise the community of the new creation. Do it quickly, O oh Lord, in this day amongst us. So let us learn the lessons from Jesus' school of prayer. Pray for justice. Pray in faith. Pray without giving up. And trust that God will grant us justice so that people may see what he is like and turn to him in faith along with us. For God loves justice. He has chosen us through the finished work of Jesus on our behalf and he acts quickly for those who pray without giving up. Let's pray together. Father, make us a people of prayer. Help us to have faith, to know who you are, the God who loves justice, who has chosen us and calls us to pray in expectation that you will respond quickly. Oh God, help us to pray without giving up, we ask, for your glory in your church. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.